Let's make some art. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, that's so cool. the theory of awesome, investigating all the scientific properties of awesome stuff everywhere. I'm Sophie Schrand, part-time muse. And I'm Trace Dominguez, and I think I'm gonna keep my day job of doing this. Tonight, we're gonna knock down an artificial boundary that seems to exist between art and science. In fact, we often talk about art and science as if they're in separate places or in competition with each other or they're not related at all. That's not true. Tonight, we will see that not only are these two fundamentally important aspects of human development not at odds, but coexisting in a way that is giving us art driven by science. I'm very excited about this episode. Yeah. Let's see our first artist. I mean, the glow in the dark, that was like a whole other thing. But this is so cool. So it's using gunpowder yeah. to create art. Right. Who would have thought? In this case, it's specifically black powder. In about the 10th century, they started coming up with ways to propel different things, signal different people around, you know, farther away in ancient China. And they came up with this mixture of charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter that we now today call black powder. So shall we try it now? Uh, yeah, we can show this pretty energetic exothermic reaction. Awesome. To so use some chem terms. It just means it gets hot. It just means it gets hot. It uh, releases about three megajoules per kilogram. Wow. Yeah. That's actually a lot. I know, right? All right. We don't ready? have a whole kilogram here, though, so we're yeah, okay. Yeah, thank goodness. You ready? Ready. OK. Cool, right? <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Black powder. So we end up with the products of that reaction, which are actually quite a few, because this black powder does not lead to one byproduct. It leads to multiple different compounds. Yeah. So we're seeing potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. Totally makes sense. We've got things like saltpeter, which is a potassium nitrate. So it makes total sense that we would see stuff like that. Yeah. You can use this to I burn a surface, but you can also use it, of course, to propel a projectile. But it's also been used in things like fireworks and in mining to uh, blast. Apart. But, you know, this is kind of, kind of small. And we're here to go big. So I think it's time maybe to bring in... Some Kevins? Yeah. Kevin! Kevin? Kevin! Oh, hi, Kevin. Oh, hey, Kevin. And Kevin. And Kevin. This is going to be cool. This is going to be cool. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I'm going to steam up this. No. <laughs> OK. Kevin? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Okay. Three, two, two one. one. Oh, that's Whoa. awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. Oh. Look at the swirl. <laughs> wow. It's raining. Oh my gosh. Look at that. <gasps> that was cool. Yeah. Holy wow. Let's get over here. <gasps> You, get, you gotta see this. You gotta see this. You ready? Yeah. Okay. <gasps> right? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Shackleton, look at Beautiful these. Wow. Beautiful. I want to own She's like very this. good at light. She uses <gasps> gravity. It's gravity art. It's gravity That's art. That's awesome. Wow. <gasps> She's great. She 100% does not use brushes for any of those amazing works. <laughs> oh, she says she started this journey using a drip technique because she wanted the paint to be less predictable. But when she switched to the squeezy bottles, she started painting with science. Mm. What we see her doing is using the force of gravity to make lines and curves. As we know, acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, but that paint doesn't look like it's falling at that rate. Why not? Friction. 
If one of those drops of paint were in free space, it would accelerate to its terminal velocity, which is when the air resistance equals the gravity and the falling paint stops accelerating. But because it's in contact with the canvas, that causes friction and prevents it from reaching that speed. The paint also causes friction with itself. If we measure the amount of internal force resisting flow, we get the magnitude, which we call viscosity, the thickness of a liquid. So you could mix your paint to different thicknesses and change the rate of flow over the canvas. You could maybe achieve wider or narrower lines or have more time to rotate the canvas for drips that were flowing more slowly. So cool. This gives me an idea, and it ticks two boxes. Let's set ourselves up to try this. We could put our theory to the test and give your little baby artist time to grow and develop. You mean, you're my favorite person in the world. Let's go to the lab. This is great. You're my no, stop you. Yeah. Let's make some art. <gasps> Ooh. Okay. Wow. Now, well, we're seeing a lot of that friction in place already, right? Can I try that? Hot pink. Yeah, you can. Here you Hot go. pink. Oh. Oh, heck yeah. That's cool. Nice. So you can see how the thickness or viscosity of this paint makes it so it's not running quite as much as the paint in our videos. Ooh, oh, I like Oh, it's these. gonna meet. It's gonna yeah. meet. It's I didn't even mean to do that. If you get really close in here, you can see that this is one of those canvases that's more of a fabric. That leaves this texture, which means even if this were slightly thinner, the canvas itself is still catching the paint as it goes, which is pretty awesome. It means, again, there are all these little variables that you have to account for when you're doing the art part of this kind of scientific process. I have a lot of respect <laughs> for our artist who we saw as far as understanding the angles of where everything's gonna go. <laughs> this isn't just any art. We're probing the art of science. So why don't we tell them what this shiny thingy here that we're standing next to is? This is a Van de Graaff generator and it is full of electrons that do not want to be anywhere near each other. I love that. Very descriptive, easy to understand. Uh, like, you know, charges repel. And this machine generates a lot of negatively charged free electrons that would really rather be with their positively charged partner. So yes, in that sense, electrons, you know, they don't really want to be near each other very much. Most people are familiar with static electricity. That's, that's actually all this is. It's a static electricity generator. Static electricity is a stationary or static built up charge that's looking for a way out. And that's why we see sparks and you get this little shock when you put on, say, a woolly sweater in the winter. That's a discharge, or a conduction of electricity through a gas, like the air around us. So, we're gonna play with this, you just bring it out for, you know, what do we, what do we think we wanna do with this here? I just always look at it. Oh, cool. We can I'm just it. kidding, we're turning it on. <laughs> yeah. This is crazy. It is shocking. It is, literally, shocking. Ooh, that was nice and I think satisfying. Technically, of course, it's negative, but I like to think of it as positive. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's really awesome. <laughs> it is really cool though. Okay, so we're we're seeing tiny lightning bolts essentially <laughs> that are burning through this wood and creating that fractionated pattern that turns into a person. Nick wow. Tesla! That guy. It's called fractal burning, or Lichtenberg figures. The tree-like shape occurs all over nature. We see it, of course, in trees, but also cracks in impervious surfaces like concrete. We see it in lightning, the veins in a tree leaf, and on and on. It's governed by constructal law. There are many advanced areas of study within constructal law, but we can think of it as the law of design. How perfectly appropriate. It is a beautiful world we live in. So this fractal burning works by passing high voltage over an insulator like rubber or plastic or especially for these purposes, who would? And because it's governed by constructal law, which says that flow structures like electrical charges must evolve to increase flow access, this shape is spontaneously created, but with purpose, and that helps. We've got our platform of wood hooked up to some electric charge. To a big transformer. There's a little more going on than that though, right? Yeah. Because yes. wood is naturally an insulator. It's, it's not a conductor. You know this because we just showed you the Van de Graaff generator inside and we were standing on wood that maybe you couldn't see, but that's what we were doing because it's an insulator, so we wouldn't shock ourselves. Right, but as we saw it with our artist who made that portrait of Tesla using burned wood, using 
tiny bits of lightning going through that wood. Yeah. We've got wood and we know that we can pass an electric charge through. So how? Basically what we have set up here is there's a positive side and a negative side and the electricity wants to move through it just like the Van de Graaff generator jumping and arcing through the air was doing but instead of arcing through the air we're going through this wood. Now even though wood is an insulator we've sprayed it with a solution of sodium bicarbonate and water so we're going to get some electrolyte on there and we should get a really cool shape but the I think kind of the fun part is we don't know what it's going to look like. Also, for safety reasons, we're not going to actually touch or move any of this around once it gets going. Safety first. You feel safe? Safe. All right, let's try it out. All right, ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. One, two, three. Turn it all the way up. Oh, oh, there oh, it goes. There, there it goes. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It's going from both sides. Oh, we've got ah, some in the middle, whoa. too. Whoa. I didn't expect that. I did not expect that. It's wow. really beautiful. That's actually. fascinating. How did it get into the middle? I'm curious what will happen when we turn. If you slow it down a little slow bit. Slow it down a little bit. Yeah, that's <gasps> about half the reaction. So it's still going in some places, but I can't make a connection anymore because I don't have enough voltage. We turn it up again? What do you think? Yeah, turn it back up. Let's see. Maybe it'll pick it up where it left off. Right. So we have those fractal patterns that are happening, right? The branching off, and then on each branch, there are more tiny little branches. Connected. It's all connected. And so we're just getting sparks all over the place. I'm going to yeah. go ahead and turn it off. Yeah. Now that it's made a connection, my assumption is that we've essentially built a circuit. This is awesome. We're all powered <laughs> down. So I'm going to take off this. Okay. Amazing. Woo. So what I think you can see now is how the artist actually did their work, right? They didn't quite have as much chaos as we did. They probably used much smaller areas and built little teeny pieces and places where they sprayed some catalyst, burned a little piece, sprayed some catalyst, burned a little piece, and created that portrait over a long period of time. Yeah, it makes me really appreciate the precise movements that the artist must have used and how long that must have taken to get individual shapes so that you could create a portrait of a person who's recognizable because we, we didn't have any control over this. We, we, made a, we made a lightning bolt. We made a lightning bolt. It's a great lightning bolt. I'm proud of us. Me too. We've been emphasizing STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math in education for years now, but the acronym STEAM gives art an equal place among the hard sciences, and rightfully so, I think. Right in the middle, because honestly, you can't have science, technology, engineering, and math without a little bit of art, and that's just the best. So I feel inspired. I hope that you do, too. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much. I'm Can't Spell STEAM Without Meats, Sophie Schramm. And I'm... I think I'm going to try this at home, Trace Dominguez. We'll see, see you, you next, next time. time.